Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the CASES webinar for technology development and applied research on the ISS National Lab. My name is Atop Essen. I am a commercial innovation lead with CASES and I'll be presenting the main part of, of the webinar. I understand that we have uh, over 200 people that signed up and there are folks that are still logging in. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to our audience for your interest and participation. And I believe that you'll find uh, the next hour uh, quite informative. So the webinar topic, Technology Development and Applied Research on the ISS National Lab is also the title of the research opportunity which we announced back on January 26th. It was a request, is a request for proposals. And so our goal with this webinar is to try to highlight the essential elements of what we're looking for in a proposal and also to answer as many questions as we can within the time allocated, if you have any questions. Uh, microphones for the audience uh, will remain muted throughout the webinar. And so if you would like to ask a question, please find the Q&A chat icon on your GoToWebinar screen, should be in your browser. And you can go ahead and type and send your question in using that feature. I want to mention we also do have a frequently asked questions page which you can navigate to from the landing page uh, for the research announcement. And I assume that all of you, if you signed up for this webinar, have all of those links. So if you haven't already, uh, please go have a look at that page in case we've already addressed your question. So we're going to dive right into it. So here's an outline of what I will be covering with the help of a few slides over about the next 30 minutes or so. The first part is going to be a quick background of the ISS National Lab and our mission, just to provide some context for the research ob ob objectives. Uh, when we get to the examples portion, I'm going to play a short video clip, about two and a half minutes long, and it'll give you a flavor of the kinds of projects uh, that recently launched to the space station, which fit underneath this technology development uh, research announcement. And we're hoping that those kinds of projects are the ones that will result from this, this research topic. Um, so then we will talk about the process, timeline, uh, award information, and round up, as I said before, by taking some questions. So before I leave this slide, I really wanted to draw your attention to those images that we have on the right, because they concisely tell the story that, that I would like to get across with this webinar. On the top, you have an artist's rendition of an operational satellite docking and refueling tanker that was designed by the company OrbitFab. Now, OrbitFab plans to launch later this year. They plan to launch that tanker uh, into space. That launch isn't going to happen with, with the ISS. But nevertheless, if, if this is successful, it could kickstart uh, OrbitFab's ability to provide commercial satellite refueling services in space to paying customers. But if you look down at the lower picture, OrbitFab, in fact, first performed tests with a prototype with the assistance of ISIS crew, and that's uh, astronaut Christine Koch in the picture. And they demonstrated and, and gained a better understanding of uh, the fluid transfer characteristics between their first prototype tankers in microgravity on the ISS. And that work was supported by a CASIS grant. So then over the span of about three years, they've gone from the lower picture, testing the prototype, to the upper picture, actually having a commercial offering for the marketplace. So this is exactly what we're trying to achieve with uh, this technology development uh, research, uh, applied research announcement. Um, going from testing on the ISS and then within a reasonable period of time, uh, achieving a commercial offering for the marketplace. So you'll hear me say that over and over again. It's a very important feature uh, of this research announcement. So I mentioned that I'm with CASIS, which stands for the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. CASIS is the nonprofit organization that manages the ISS National Lab under a cooperative agreement with NASA. 
the International Space Station, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, has been in orbit for over 20 years. And as of last November 2020, we celebrated that 20 year anniversary. But it's a partnership between the US and our space agency, NASA, and four other countries and their space agencies. So we've got Russia, Japan, China, and uh, the EU member states, and ESA, the European Space Agency. In 2005, the US Congress designated the US portion of the ISS as a national government laboratory. And the intent was really to open up access to the facilities for scientific work that would improve the quality of life on Earth, right? So not just NASA using it. They wanted to promote a collaboration amongst diverse users and also use these facilities and the ability to do work uh, on the ISIS National Lab as a tool for STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math to inspire our younger generations. So the, the ISIS National Lab, it does continue to be used by NASA for space exploration related uh, research. Fast forward to 2010 and Congress then directed NASA to appoint a manager for the ISIS National Lab and this manager would additionally focus on increasing the use of the lab by the private sector, by uh, non-NASA, other US government agencies, and also increased use by academic and other research institutions. So this is the role that CASES was appointed to in 2011, and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. So to fulfill this role of managing the ISIS National Lab, we work in very close coordination with NASA. We also work uh, in coordination and in partnership with a group of private companies that we call implementation partners. And these are uh, companies that have expertise uh, working in space and they assist with integrating the experiments that our user community proposes uh, after we review and approve them, they integrate those experiments into the ISIS operation and they, they help with flight readiness. Uh, there is a subset of implementation partners that we refer to as commercial service providers. Uh, these commercial prov service providers own and operate on orbit assets to provide payload hosting and, and operating services as well. So these are our key partners in, in helping to manage the ISIS National Lab. So we very actively promote the results of the work that's done uh, on the ISIS National Lab in order to demonstrate how the results of that work uh, improves the lives of people on earth and actually provides value back to the nation and ultimately to the world. So that's a key piece of, of, of what CASES does. Uh, one of the ways that we source ideas and projects for the ISS is to create new partnerships across different disciplines with private companies, with entrepreneurs, with startups, and as I mentioned before, with, you know, with academic and government institutions. So for example, the current research announcement uh, may lead to new partnerships with some of you that are in our audience today. I also wanted to mention that we very actively engage with the investor uh, community. Uh, we have fostered introductions to our investor network which currently consists of about 200 members. And these are investors that are very interested in staying engaged with the unique research that is happening on the ISS, uh, which CASES supports. And so uh, when they know what's going on, they can make informed decisions about projects and about companies that they may want to invest in and help promote the growth of a space-based economy. Now, since NASA is our sponsor, CASES is only able to work with US researchers. So US principal investigators, and US entities. So please be sure that you meet those criteria if you are responding to this research announcement and submitting a proposal. So as I said, the user community that I just described uh, needs a way to be able to propose ideas uh, to cases for use of the ISIS National Lab. And so that's where these research announcements uh, come in. Uh, throughout the year, you can expect to see uh, more research announcements that are focused on, on, on different topics and different objectives. But the one that we have just released, which is the subject of this webinar, is for applied research. And what we're looking for are projects and proposals with clear pathways to practical applications that can provide tangible value 
back to the organization doing the work. And as I mentioned before, ultimately back to the nation, right? So we're after project outcomes that are gonna drive economic benefit uh, either directly or maybe indirectly. So it may be the testing of a product, for example, that uh, resolves a key technology hurdle, which then allows you to go to the marketplace with that product, or maybe it, en it, it enhances and expands the, the market reach for that product. Or it may be, for example, uh, using space-based data to improve modeling of a system in a way that allows you to drive an improved design of a product or improve the operational efficiency of a phys physical or biological system. Really generically, what I'm saying is it has to provide something of tangible value to an end user. This is a really important component of this research announcement. So, so those are just some generic examples. And we, uh, we also listed some other ideas in the research announcement, which I'll come back to. If you uh, are familiar with uh, technology readiness levels and you speak that language, then for this research announcement, for your proposal, you should be considering maturation of technology that is currently somewhere around a TRL four or higher and looking to raise that to somewhere around a TRL seven or higher, right? So your proposal should be clearly support should be able to clearly support these ranges. And those numbers that I'm putting out there, don't take them as absolutes, just take them as a guide. Uh, but again, this, this whole proposal is geared towards uh, technology maturation. So here's those same things, again, re-emphasized. And I took this right out of the research uh, announcement instruction document. So if you read that document, then you're familiar with these bullet points. Again, think in, in terms of your proposal having a line of sight to commercial application. Think in terms of enabling a commercial offering to an end user, uh, hopefully within a reasonable period of time after you conclude your work on, on the ISS and do a space-based test. Uh, the third thing to mention here is that this research announcement is open to, is, is broadly open to topics in the physical or the life sciences. So we have had previous solicitations that targeted uh, the areas of advanced materials and translational medicine. And, uh, and, and, and those resulted in some programs and projects in those areas that target, for example, specific kinds of materials like exotic optical fibers or uh, certain polymers that are used for 3D printing, for example. Uh, on the life sciences side, uh, some of those projects address specific diseases, you know, like cancer or the creation of new drugs for immunotherapy treatments. So we want to continue to build on those areas. And we're very interested in proposals that deal with advanced materials or translational medicine. But I, I do want to make it clear that uh, for this research announcement, other topic areas are clearly in scope. And as I said before, we, we listed some of those in the RA document. Uh, those include things like crystal growth for organic or inorganic systems. It includes uh, biofabrication uh, type technology, so 3D printing or other fabrication techniques for biological systems. Maybe you have a uh, device that's based on quantum technology that you want to fly up to the ISS and, and test quantum communications. Maybe you've got a, uh, a, a new computer that you want to send up to the ISS and test its capability uh, to operate in a harsh environment or for space-based computing. It could be something to do with artificial intelligence or automation or robotics. Again, the, or, or more remote sensing and, and uh, satellite technology. So again, the idea is that the research announcement is very broad. It can include all of, all of these topics and projects uh, within the scope for this research announcement. So let's touch on why would you want to do research in space? Uh, so you would want to do that because space affords the opportunity for scientific and technical discoveries uh, under the unique and persistent conditions on the ISS, which you can't replicate on Earth, right? So those conditions, microgravity, the extreme conditions, uh, they can dramatically impact and change the behavior and the dynamics of physical systems or biological systems in ways that are unexpected. And so those unexpected behaviors are what form the basis for the new discoveries or insights as you test and demonstrate 
uh, your technology. So there's persistent microgravity, and that is the case because the space station is constantly in free fall around the Earth. Uh, microgravity will result in the phenomena that you see listed on the bottom part of the slide, lower left. And I don't want to get, get too deeply into the science of this because that's not the point of this webinar. But a uh, lack of buoyancy or density-driven convection, for example, can allow studies of the structure and the characteristics of flames. You can ask questions like, you know, under what conditions do flames burn at cooler temperatures and, and more uniformly than they do when you have combustion on Earth? And then how can you use that information to practically, to practically, for example, design burner systems um, with improved fuel efficiency or lower emissions? So again, going from the science all the way to a practical example, that would be of value to an end user. Uh, on the life sciences side, we can study accelerated disease models, for example. We know that long-term exposure of biological systems to microgravity can cause fairly quick inducement of changes that normally would be associated with aging and chronic diseases on Earth. So things like immune dysfunction, things like cardiovascular deconditioning, things like loss of muscle mass. These are changes that we can observe in model organisms or using tissue constructs that we can fly up to the space station. So researchers can gather all of this space-based data and use that to create models of these systems. And then these models can be used to design therapies, right? Uh, that can then be offered to the marketplace to combat these diseases. So again, going from the science and the experiment, maturing a technology to a practical application for the marketplace. So that's microgravity. When you look at extreme conditions, the ISS offers uh, the ability to expose payloads to extreme conditions in low Earth orbit. And those conditions, again, are listed there uh, underneath uh, the image in the middle. Uh, many research take advantage of this for accelerated materials testing, trying to understand failure modes of different materials, or really just the, the durability or suitability of those materials uh, for use under harsh conditions, whether those harsh conditions be down here on Earth or even in space. And so we have uh, several uh, commercial service providers with, with facilities uh, on the space station for hosting such payloads. And the one you see there in the picture is from one of our uh, CSPs, Alpha Space, and that's the MISI platform. <clears throat> and then if you look at the vantage point, uh, this affords the opportunity to test different kinds of prototype sensors. And we've been doing this for a long time on the space station. So we've tested hyperspectral technologies, multispectral technologies, LIDAR technology. Um, we've tested cameras. Uh, the inclined uh, non-sun-synchronous orbit of the space station allows you to gather data from these different sensors under different conditions and different times. And so those data sets can complement uh, the other kinds of data that you would get from satellites that are in a fixed geosynchronous, uh, sun-synchronous orbit, for example, and focused on uh, one particular target all the time. So I, I really think one of the reasons the ISS is unique uh, when it comes to the vantage point is because uh, the sensor data can be gathered in all of these different modes using multiple sensors simultaneously. So if you're looking at you know, what's happening in uh, trying to monitor emissions over a, a power plant or a processing facility, for instance, or if you're trying to understand better what's happening uh, with an agricultural patch of land, then all of these sensors can gather data uh, for these targets under many different conditions, and you have more information to be able to, to, to analyze what's going on and create a product that's going to be useful for optimizing those operations. So all of this to say that your proposal should be very clear about why you need to use the ISS. This is, this is also key. Typically, it is because you need to use one of these conditions to mature your technology and again, to prepare it for the marketplace. So as you're writing up your proposal, your concepts, be sure to make uh, this very clear in your proposal. Why do you need ISS? What is the benefit of coming to the space station to do your test as opposed to doing it on the ground? Okay, so let's look at a few examples and what I'm going to do here is play a short uh, video clip. It's going to last about two and a half uh, minutes, as I mentioned before. And 
these are projects that were supported by cases recently launched in the ISS. And as I said before, it's to give you an idea of, of what we're looking for with this uh, research announcement. So watch for the following things. Watch for the innovation that's involved with these uh, projects. Watch for the practical commercial application that the work is driving towards. And also watch for the variety of disciplines and industries that's represented here. So I'll go ahead and play that video. Adidas, the shoe and apparel giant, will be sending its proprietary Boost shoe technology to station for evaluation. With this experiment, Adidas will observe the flow of different sized foam particles and microgravity to improve product design for athletes around the world. Delta Fawcett will investigate water droplet formation on the space station to enhance the company's H2O kinetic showerhead technology. This technology takes an innovative approach to water conservation by controlling the size and speed of water droplets so the water pressure feels the same even though the showerhead is dispensing less water. This study will explore ways to better control water droplets to further enhance the H2O kinetic technology. Not only is Northrop Grumman the launch service provider for this mission, but they're also sending a payload of its own as a technology prototype demonstration. SharkSat is a small payload that will mount to the Cygnus spacecraft with a mission to collect telemetry data demonstrating the feasibility of new sensors and processing new technologies in low Earth orbit. Maiden Space will be launching a ceramic manufacturing facility that will leverage microgravity to produce turbine components with improved performance for use in the aerospace industry. This is the latest step by the company to expand its in-space manufacturing capabilities for consumers on Earth. Three projects on this mission are funded by the National Institutes of Health through its joint multi-year tissue chips in space initiative with the ISS National Lab. Tissue chips are small devices engineered to grow human cells on an artificial scaffold to model the structure and function of human tissues. Studying tissue chips in space may accelerate pathways for understanding disease and developing new treatments for use on Earth and beyond. Bristol Myers Squibb, a leading pharmaceutical company, is launching a protein crystallization investigation aimed at improving drug formulation and delivery for patients on Earth. In this experiment, the team will study the crystallization of monoclonal antibodies in space to improve their crystallization back on the ground. Monoclonal antibodies are lab-created proteins designed to interact with specific targets called antigens and are used in the treatment of several diseases, including cancer. Please visit issnationallab.org. So that was uh, a short video clip, as I said, of projects that uh, were supported by, by cases to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we're looking for with this research announcement. You saw their Adidas uh, working on a materials development. You saw Delta Fawcett with a shower, uh, a shower head uh, prototype technology, uh, which they would like to use to drive uh, water conservation. Um, you saw Northrop Grumman with the Sharksat, uh, Sharksat technology for remote sensing. And then Maiden Space, Maiden Space is actually one of our implementation partners uh, working on ceramic turbine components for their in-space manufacturing facility. And then also there was tissue, chip, tissue, tissue chips um, looking at using human cells for disease modeling and then uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb with protein crystal growth and, and studying monoclonal uh, antibodies, again, to try to develop uh, novel therapies uh, for uh, immunotherapy treatments. So if you would like to learn more about any of these particular examples, please visit our website, uh, issnationallab.org, and you can find in-depth articles on any of these. And before I move on, I also wanted to mention on this particular slide, which you're looking at, this is actually one more example. And the black and white uh, picture is imagery from a proprietary uh, hyperspectral sensor, which was developed by the company Orbital Sidekick. Uh, they first tested this hyperspectral sensor on the ISS with support from a CASIS grant. The test was a huge success and it catapulted Orbital Sidekick almost immediately into position of being able to provide services to commercial and government clients. 
and they have since gone on to raise additional significant amounts of capital, expand their business to the point of, of getting ready to launch a free flyer. So again, another example of the kinds of projects we're looking for and the kinds of outcomes we hope to achieve uh, with this research announcement. So the ISS has an extensive array of facilities for applied research in life and physical sciences. Uh, I encourage you to review these facilities using the links that have been provided in the research announcement instructions. We've also put a couple of those links in here. The ISS uh, Researcher Guide Series and Space Station Explorer. Uh, you are able to propose a much stronger concept, I believe, if you have a good idea of the facilities which you would like to use. So there are the ISS facilities, and I've also uh, made mention of our implementation partners that provide their services for a fee to be able to translate your project idea into a fit for space experiment. So the implementation partners may assist you with the use of the ISS facilities that I mentioned in the previous slide, but also many of them, the commercial service providers, have their own state-of-the-art commercial facilities on the ISS. So for additional information on the implementation partners and commercial service providers, their capabilities, please visit the implementation partner database. Again, the link is up here on the screen, but it's also in the uh, research uh, announcement uh, document. So our IPs are quite experienced, our implementation partners are quite experienced when it comes to ISS-based work. So I would encourage you, particularly if you are new to working on the ISS, to contact them if you need to for an initial discussion about your project. Uh, some of you may need to get a realistic order of magnitude estimate of what your project might cost, so uh, a conversation with them would be very helpful uh, for that. So, so those are the facilities. Again, the regular uh, ISS facilities and also the implementation partner facilities available uh, for you. Okay, so let's talk about funding as we uh, bring this section of the webinar home. So for the sake of this discussion, you can think of the costs of doing an experiment on the ISS uh, basically in three categories. One category consists of your direct costs. So your time, your people's time, uh, your equipment, fabrication costs, testing that you would do on the ground to, to initially you know, prove it out, et cetera. So for this research announcement, we expect you to cover those costs. We expect the organization proposing to be able to cover those costs. Cases doesn't have any funding set aside for that. The second category of costs uh, are the implementation partners costs. Now, most people aren't used to these costs because normally, you know, particularly if you're doing work on the ground here, you don't normally need this sort of third party assistance to execute your, ex your experiment and your idea. But when it comes to doing space-based work, and particularly on the ISS, we find that it's really, really essential to have this implementation partner alongside you, again, to help prepare your experiment for success on the space station. So the $1 million set aside that we have from cases is, is to assist with the implementation partner category of costs. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that we will cover uh, an impl implementation partner's cost 100% for a particular project that we may select. That may be the case, but it may not be the case, right? Uh, we are anticipating that we will have more than one open period, likely two open periods, uh, this fiscal year for this technology development research announcement. So the $1 million set aside is a total figure for all of the open periods and cycles that we will have for this technology development and applied research area. <clears throat> Now, the third category of costs, I mentioned three categories, right? So your direct cost, implementation partner cost, but the third category is uh, launch to the ISS and the cost of any crew resources that you may need to actually perform your experiment, um, data return, payload return if it's required. All of those kinds of costs in this third category will be 100% covered by cases. So you don't even have to worry about that when you're working up your budget. Any award that we make, We'll always have this third category, the launch and crew time uh, and resource costs, always covered. 
it may be that that is all that you need, right, for your project. If you're able to self-fund everything else, right, then that could result in what we call an unfunded agreement, right, if your proposal is selected and approved. Um, but if in addition to covering the launch costs, you need some funding to cover the IP costs, then that would be more like a funded agreement, right? So that's what I mean uh, when I say that awards may be funded or unfunded. I hope that explanation is clear, but if it's not, put a question into the chat and we will try to address that uh, very shortly. So once we select an award, a particular project, uh, the time that it takes before your experiment would fly to the ISS depends largely on the complexity of what you're trying to do, as well as the availability of uh, space on the supply vessel. But it can vary uh, really anywhere from about nine months to about one and a half years. It, again, really de depends largely on, on those two factors. Um, and then, you know, there may be unforeseen things like we, we just had, you know, in for most of 2020 with, with the pandemic, which may introduce additional disruptions. So in very rare cases, maybe we might, we might be able to do something that's faster than uh, nine months for a very simple experiment, but that's really rare. So whatever the case, we expect that within three years from when we award a project, uh, the work should be finished. And so that includes all reporting. So three years from the date of award, you should be uh, complete completely done with the experiment. So that's the extent of, 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 of what I'd like to cover here under award information. Again, if you have any questions on this, uh, please put that in the chat and we will uh, attempt to address those as we go along. So the last slide that I have, uh, how do you actually get to an award? So that's a two-step process. So the first step is to submit a concept summary and those are going to be due uh, on February 25th. If you can get your concept summary in earlier, uh, that's better um, because if it's then selected, you have more time to work on the next phase, which is the whole proposal. But uh, during the concept summary, uh, we do a high level review for operational feasibility, um, for the scientific and technical scope, and also do a preliminary compliance uh, review. And so if you pass uh, that step, then we will contact you and invite you to submit a full proposal, which will be due uh, by April 26. And please honor those dates. Uh, don't submit late proposals. We won't be able to accept those. So step two is only by invitation after you uh, go through and pass the uh, step one review. And during step two, we will also uh, pair you up. We have a process to pair you up with an implementation partner. And so part of the documentation that uh, you will provide when you're submitting the proposal at the end of step two is the implementation partner scope of work, work and their budget, will, which will be incorporated into the overall uh, budget uh, for your proposal. So uh, the proposal evaluation uh, process, the criteria that we use for that and how we do that, uh, that's all detailed in documents that are available on uh, on the website. So again, if you go to the webpage, you can download all of these instruction documents. I encourage you to go through them uh, thoroughly and to make sure that you're familiar uh, with, with that process. I do want to go back and emphasize on the con on concept summary. Please make sure that it is no more than three pages. Sometimes we do get uh, proposals or, or people try to submit you know, concept summaries that are very long and that's not what we're looking for. You can imagine that, that if we get uh, quite a large number of these, and we do in response to these uh, these, these requests for proposals and re research announcements, then we wanna be able to go through those quickly and respond uh, back uh, to the principal investigator. So please try to keep those to three pages. Okay, so those are the main points that I wanted to cover. And so with that, we're going to move right along into questions. And for this part, I do have uh, other members of the, the CASES team 
uh, from different departments who may assist with answering uh, questions, um, depending on what the question is. So we will introduce them uh, if, if they do need to speak up and answer a question. So let's go ahead and have a look at different questions. Okay, so there's a question here and it's compliance related. And it says, can a US company acting as a PI on a proposal have a non-US partner? And specifically, uh, the non-US country in question here is Canada. So I'm going to invite uh, Ashley O'Brien, who's uh, a manager from our legal and compliance department to uh, to help us address that question. So Ashley, if you could please turn your mic on and uh, take the question again. It's can a US company that's acting as a PI on a proposal have a non-US partner, specifically Canada? Thank you, Atop. Hi, I'm Ashley O'Brien. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I work for the Contracts and Compliance Department in uh, cases. Um, regarding your question, um, the principal investigator and any co-principal investigators need to be U.S. persons. And the entity, the organization that we contract with needs to be a U.S. organization as well. Who you choose uh, as the principal investigator and your entity to do business with um, is not within our control. There are um, legal, there are ramifications and you are required to follow all proper ex regulations and have the appropriate licensing in place because there's always a chance that there might be some ITAR or EAR um, impact based on what your experiment is or your project involves um, and that we leave completely up to you. Um, you, you have the opportunity to have a Canadian or, or Australian or any um, other nationality as a subcontractor or a a partner uh, in this agreement but um, we cases will not be directly contracting with a foreign entity i hope that answers the question okay thank you very much ashley and i also want to mention in that regard that uh, we have received questions of this flavor and of this nature um, and so I would encourage you to go to the Frequently Asked Questions page and also read through that uh, for some additional uh, 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 questions along these lines and, and the responses that we have provided, which again are very much along the lines of the answer that Ashley just gave. So thanks, Ashley. Okay, uh, another question here. Uh, which we may call on Ashley also to address. Are FFRDCs eligible to apply? So those are federally funded research and development uh, corporations. And Ashley, would you like to take that or you, would you like me to take a stab at that? Um, I, I believe that they are eligible to apply. I would like to um, take it under consideration and, and be allowed to confirm that with um, some fellow members of the contracts and compliance department, but I'm under the impression that um, there is no restriction. Okay, so tentative yes, but we will take that back and confirm that internally. Thanks for the question. So again, there's a question here, can a non-immigrant act as PI for proposal? Again, I think that this is, uh, this, is, this is along the same lines of the first question that was asked. I really would encourage you to go to the FAQ page and read through that. Uh, I think that we have addressed this one. Okay, another question. Can we submit multiple proposals in different emphasis areas? And the person asking the question uh, goes on to indicate that they have one in the materials area. Uh, so a particular kind of alloy and also could submit a concept um, 
for an optical system for remote sensing? So I'll take that one. And the answer is yes, uh, there's no restriction on submitting uh, multiple proposals, uh, as long as those areas are in fact different and, and what you're seeking to do uh, is, is sufficiently different for, uh, for, for the concepts that you're proposing. So the answer is yes, you can submit multiple proposals. The same organization can submit multiple, multiple proposals. Okay, uh, here's another question. Uh, can funding from this uh, national lab research announcement, I guess that assumes that if your proposal was, uh, was selected and funded, can that funding be included as part of an SBIR or STTR, that's a NASA SBIR or STTR, I assume, uh, phase two application, right? So in, for the phase two applications, the SBIR program seeks matching funds uh, for the R&D project. So the question is, can, uh, would a cases grant, would funds from a cases grant qualify as matching funds uh, for an SBIR program? That's, that's one aspect of the question. And Ashley, would you like to take that one as well? Um, I can't answer whether it would qualify as matching funds because I'm not on that end of the, I'm not in the, the NASA side, but um, wanting to use this as, um, as matching fund, wanting, wanting to do is not, is not a problem that we, you are welcome to do this, but I'm not sure if it would actually qualify that NASA would have to answer that question. That's right. So. You know, we do have, uh, I'll just add that we do have a number of um, proposals we see from researchers that kind of go the other way. So they may be awarded a grant from NASA through applying to SBIR or STTR, and then they will use that in their application uh, to, to cases for cases grant. So, so Ashley is correct. We don't have an issue with it on, on our side, but you have to check. Uh, from the NASA side of things as well. And then there's a second part of the question, is there precedence for phase 2E investment? I assume what you're asking there is, has cases invested before? Um, to the best of my knowledge, I don't believe so, but that's something that we would have to take back uh, and, and check. So, so, so cases itself has not been a principal investigator or a co-investigator in an SBIR or SCTR phase 2 investment to the best of my knowledge. I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay. Another question. Is the goal of this call to test and mature technologies for commercialization on Earth or to mature technologies for use on the ISS or on missions? For the latter, which is technologies for use on the ISS or on missions, it is hard to estimate market share. Okay, so. The goal is definitely to test and mature technologies for commercialization on Earth. That's certainly a part of what we would like to accomplish. Um, however, you know, I, I think that it's 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 up to the the proposer, uh, the principal investigator, and the proposal to make the case for what that commercialization looks like. So, so it could be for Earth. It could be an application uh, on the ISS. It could be an application. Uh, for for other aspects of the space economy, if you will, so uh, I, I think that you know you should you should make that case as much as possible. Whatever that application is, whether it's on Earth or in space, how is it providing tangible value back to you as a company, and also then back to the nation? That's what we're looking for. So, but but yes, that that is that is the goal is is to mature technologies that will achieve that. Okay, so another question here, since CASIS is U.S. focused, can a proposed U.S. system be attached to Bartolomeo? Okay, so Bartolomeo is a platform that is owned and operated by one of our implementation partners, which is Airbus. And I have some thoughts on this question, but I, uh, I wanted to see if um, Justin Doyle, who's an operations manager, 
uh, with cases. Justin, do you have any thoughts on this question? Again, it's saying since cases is US focused, can a US system be attached to the Bartolomeo platform? So I, so the short answer is yes, we could absolutely use the Bartolomeo, I'm not gonna try to say it, that platform that is operated by Airbus through agreement with ESA, that's true, but yes, we can still, we have an agreement in place in order to use that platform. So that is a viable platform for this solicitation. Absolutely, and I would agree with that answer. Thank you, Justin. Okay, so another one, and this appears to be also for you, Justin, so you can stay uh, stay up. So are there established mass and volume restrictions for our experiments? And that's very general, but uh, you wanna take a stab at that, please? So I would say there's no restriction, right? So that's something that what I would encourage you to do is put in your concept, and that's something we can discuss with you. Um, you can also reach out directly to the operations group and we can give you some guidelines on that. Um, obviously, we only have a few vehicles that can launch to the space station and those vehicles do have mass limits and we only have a small part of that. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, a SpaceX vehicle can launch about 2,000 kilograms to orbit. Um, of that, you know, we might get less than 500 of that because it has to launch crew supplies, vehicle supplies. Um, other NASA experiments and other of our own experiments. So, so we end up we end up running into some real world limitations pretty quickly. But I wouldn't say there's any specific limitation on your project. Um, it just depends on what you're trying to do, and it becomes kind of a value proposition of if those resources are worthwhile considering what you're trying to accomplish. Excellent answer. Thanks, Justin. And uh, Justin referred to contacting the operations team. Uh, we do have uh, the email address in the research announcement instructions, but it's also up here on my screen. So that's ops at issnationallab.org. Okay. It looks like we have another operations related question here. So this says, would typically GFE items like FRAM hardware or gold to connectors be included in quote unquote funded items. Uh, and the, the second part kind of says, I assume that LV integration is included in launch. For for example, external payloads that are going up with a dragon trunk, dragon trunk. So the real question is the first part. So would, would GFE items be included in funded items? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Um, that would have to be either provided, I guess, by the, as part of the implementation partner cost, or that would have to be provided by your organization. Uh, the integration would be included, but if you need to buy a frame or a gold two or something along those lines, that would have to come out of your cost or out of the IP cost. Yeah, it sounds to me like that's, you know, those are materials or items that you need uh, as part of uh, putting together your experiment, your your fabrication, if you will. So yeah, I would think that those are costs that the uh, proposer has to cover. And I do want to point out that uh, the lead time for those kind of experiments is very, very long. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're trying to propose something that involves uh, flying in the dragon trunk. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Hope that answered the uh, question. Okay. So another question here. Historically, what are the most common hurdles to small business competing for these awards? I don't know that there is any one particular factor uh, that would prevent a small business from, from competing. Um, certainly funding is always an issue, uh, or maybe not, I shouldn't use the word, funding is always a challenge, right? Um, the two examples that I mentioned at the beginning and at the end, the one with OrbitFab. OrbitFab was a startup out of uh, San Francisco, the San Francisco, San Francisco area. And um, Orbital Sidekick with the remote sensing, the hyperspectral sensor, was also a startup when they came to the ISS. Um, and so we assisted, you know, with, with the cases grants, the resources that we had, we assisted with some funding uh, to get them onto, this, onto the space station. But I think the critical thing is what is your idea? What is your project? What is your concept? What is the innovation that's there? Do you really need to, to use the ISS? And again, for this particular um, research announcement, 
what is that line of sight to commercial viability? So uh, that's the most critical thing. Um, is 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 the is the idea really good and golden? And then I would think the next thing is certainly it's uh, funding is a challenge, and you know for this particular research announcement where we do expect you to cover some of those costs, then um, that's something that you're you're going to have to to address. But other than that, um, again, I think that if you have a good idea and if you're responsive to the criteria. Uh, which we have outlined for proposal, submission, and evaluation, uh, and you go through that process and get approved, then there isn't any particular, any other particular specific challenge, I think, uh, that is germane to a small business. Okay, another question. Are there any intellectual property guidelines or requirements within the CASES program when working with implementation partners or national labs? Okay, I think I'm actually going to bring in Ashley to uh, address this one. So, so the question, Ashley, are there any intellectual property guidelines or requirements within the CASES program when working with the implementation partners or, or the national lab? Yes, yes, there are. Um, and I would refer you to our website and to actually look over the terms and conditions of our standard agreement. Um, and you will, there are um, several flow downs that come to us from NASA regarding intellectual property and rights and data that um, you might want to look over. And I recommend you looking over. They, they are required part of our contracting with our. Um, partners and entities. So um, yes, there are definitely <laughs> several clauses regarding intellectual property and please look them over. It's, it's too great for me to summarize right here at this moment. Okay, and uh, that's a question you may actually want to email into us if, if that's a concern for you, uh, whoever it was that submitted that question. Um, so you can email that into us using uh, the email address. I have my email address listed, esen.issnationallab.org. It's also on the research um, announcement document. Uh, so if you want that addressed in some more detail, then uh, we can get an answer back to you. Okay, uh, we have time for maybe a couple of more questions. Okay, so there's one here. Your examples of leveraging the ISS to make a product are by and large coming from companies that are well established and then use the ISS to refine existing product lines. So can you provide some examples in which a relatively unknown company takes an idea from TRL4 into a tangible terrestrial product by leveraging microgravity? Okay. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, well, let me just say that the answer is yes. We, we do have, we do have those, uh, those kinds of examples where a startup company or entrepreneur comes and uh, uses a CASES grant, does a test on the ISS and does some TRL raising and then you know, gets to a, a terrestrial product. I think that Orbital Sidekick is a very good example of that. Um, we partner with the Mass Challenge Accelerator and we tap into their network of entrepreneurs and startups that have you know, many different ideas uh, for testing. And um, uh, several of those companies, I don't have a listing here in front of me, uh, over the years, and we've, we've been partnering with Mass Challenge for since about 2014, so quite a number of years. Several of those companies have actually uh, done this where they've had a, a product or a concept, they've tested that on the space station, matured it, and then they've gone uh, and been able to uh, provide a, uh, a commercial product to the marketplace. So the answer is yes. And if you email me, uh, I can send you uh, some tangible examples. It just so happened that you know I, I wanted to use the, the video uh, to bring the point across and the video had uh, these other companies, that you know the larger companies that you mentioned. But yes, we have done it with smaller companies as well. Okay, what if an implementation partner is already a partner on our R&D project? 
can the IP apply directly for funding under this uh, NRLA? Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, um, it's whether the IP itself can apply for funding. Um, I'll, I'll bring Ashley in on that if she has any thoughts, but I, th I think that given that we have actually set aside uh, funding to cover the IP costs, it really should take care of what you're asking here, if I understand correctly. So when you put together a budget uh, for your project and you submit that, um, it is going to have uh, your IP scope of work and the IP costs as part of that budget. And so if we were to select and approve your project uh, and provide funding uh, for that, that IP piece, then yes, the, you know, we, we would cover that. Now, if you're asking the other question, well, let me stop there and, and, and see if Ashley has any, any, any comments on that. Yes, I agree completely with your statement so far. Okay, good. Yes. So if, if, if you're asking, can an IP be a principal investigator and apply for funding? That's a, that's a, separate, that's a separate question. Um, that's, that's one that we would have to look at, unless you have any thoughts about that, Ashley. Yes, that would make things a bit um, difficult. We might even have to separate out what are the costs of you as a as as an entity using our facilities, as opposed to what are your duties as the implementation part. It would be very complicated. So that would be something we would need to look into in depth. Yes. So if you if, again, if that's a concern to you, whoever asked that question, please uh, email us, and then we can take a closer look at that internally. Okay, we are right at uh, 1 Central to Eastern, and that is the time that we had allocated for this webinar. Uh, it was about an hour. So I'd like to thank all of you that uh, tuned in, logged in, and participated uh, in the webinar. We hope you found it informative and useful. I will post, uh, we will post this presentation up to the uh, website uh, if you need it. But again, I strongly encourage you to look at not just the presentation, but all of the research announcement documents for step one and step two that we've posted on the landing page and also the FAQ section. So with that, again, thank you very much uh, for your time and we look forward to receiving all of your uh, proposals and concepts and ideas in the coming weeks. Thank you very much.